Well, hi, good morning. Thanks so much for joining me here in my shop. It's January 28th, almost the end of January. And uh, there's not an awful lot left uh, to do with this, with this radio, but it gets a little more involved uh, from here forward. So I'm going to be doing a few things today or trying to get through a few things. One of them is reviewing the schematic. I think I mentioned or I muttered in an earlier video that I might not look at the schematic, but I did, and it's an excellent schematic two-pager with lots of information. Uh, very, very good uh, schematics. We're going to go through that. One of the first things I'm going to correct is a false description of how this antenna <laughs> operates. Uh, off the top of my head, I got it wrong. And you know, I like to do these videos right off the top of my head. I don't sit and rehearse to any great degree. Uh, I just kind of have a bit, bit of a notion about what I'm going to do over the next hour, hour and a half uh, when I get going. So. From time to time, I'm wrong. Actually, a lot of the time I can be wrong. You know, it's a process of discovery when you're working on something like this. And there's a lot more wrongness to find than there is rightness. So uh, so I apologize if I threw anybody off with this antenna. The way I described it is true for other radios, not so true for this one. And we're going to take a look at that right now. Go through the schematic. Okay, let's take a quick overview of what we've got available here. I'm just going to zoom out a bit. I can see the whole page. This is one page of two. So here's the schematic up here. And there's a picture of what's right beside me here in my shop. A stringing diagram I fortunately haven't needed to pay attention to. There's the power supply. There's the receiver. And this is a look at the uh, multi-switch that's on the front of the radio selecting phono and uh, phono or radio. And we have another page. Lots of writing on it. Basic specifications. Alignment procedure. Alignment chart to help get through the process. Looks like there's five steps here. Special notes at the bottom. general description, conditions of test. So this chart shows pin voltages on the vacuum tube sockets. 240 volt, 102 volt, very, very useful information uh, here. This is the power supply here, conditions of test. So you can imitate this by using similar test equipment. Stage gain and voltage checks. Very interesting. So it looks like the engineer who engineers and designers who worked on this particular radio took some time to write a very nice write up here. That's great. They're probably very proud of what they did. Okay, so we're going to zoom in on the schematic. We're going to kind of go through it from front to back as best I can and uh, see what there is. I don't think anything too surprising here, although I am going to start off with, uh, let's start off with the power supply. So dash line indicates a separate chassis. The power comes in straight onto the primary, off onto here, which is going up to the on-off switch, which would be located on the back of the volume control, and a separate plug to plug in the record player motor. Here they're showing the uh, motor arrangement. Look, look what they've done here. So this is the motor here, driving the Platter that indicates the uh, you know where you're dropping the records. This indicates the uh, needle. They've drawn it. It's interesting. It's the schematic and pictorial at the same time. It's very interesting. Here we see the coil that's uh, generating the electricity that's going to be fed into the uh, radio. And then later I'm going to talk about this very important circuit here, which is the reason why you can use a magnetic cartridge and not a uh, much much less much less wonderful ceramic cartridge so okay let's start with the antenna now I think when I looked at the antenna I saw it was uh, two coils and uh, I said the larger coil was resonated with the uh, tuning capacitor and then the smaller coil was the pickup coil that would be attached to the uh, grid now eh, not right close but no cigar on that so here, here we see a, a symbolic outdoor wire antenna of some sort. And we just follow where it's going. It's going 
No, it's just going to ground. Now we, we don't know quite yet what this means. Probably means onto the chassis. But we don't know that just yet. We'll figure that out in a, in a moment. I didn't really finish with the power supply, did I? But that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll get there eventually. I'm just I'm anxious to correct the situation with the antenna. So this looks like about one turn. And this looks like about three turns. Of course, there's many more turns here. So they symbolize it here as less turns and more turns. So the antenna is hooked up to the less turns, just a couple turns. Maybe we'll take a peek at the antenna in a minute. And the multiple turns have got to be, I'm looking at it now, maybe 15 or maybe even 20 turns of wire on the antenna. <clears throat> One end is connected here. You see a capacitor down to what is probably the chassis here. Kind of interesting that this wire doesn't go right to the chassis. Well, I guess it does. It's, it, it, um, the, the, the trick here, uh, a little early to explain this, is you want to apply a chassis ground to the antenna to make it work well. And so that's done through this capacitor. But at the same time, you want to be able to sneak a DC voltage through the antenna to reach the grid. And the DC voltage is coming from over here, which I'll explain when I get there. But this is, this is part of the automatic volume control scheme. So, okay. Now, follow along, we see the uh, trimmer capacitor and the big tuning capacitor, the one you adjust with the knob on the front. Tuning, this is tuning in conjunction with the coil here, the uh, antenna coil. And that's fed to grid number three in this. There's a lot of grids in this tube. A lot, a lot of tubes, just think, look at this one, only has one grid. This one's got a big whack of them. I won't go into details about it. Uh, why so many grids? We'll just, we'll just work our way through the schematic. So, so here, whatever you've tuned the antenna to, let's assume you've tuned it to 590, the sports channel around here. That signal is on this grid. It's affecting the current flow through the tube. Now there's another signal grid here. And that's this one right here close to the cathode. This is sort of the inside grid if you like. And it's it's coming down here to this. Whoa, what's going on? This isn't connected. So this is a, uh, uh, I'm gonna say loosely coupled, yeah, barely coupled pickup coil picking up some energy out of this, out of this coil. So why they've pictured it this way on the schematic to, to let you know that. This coil is being resonated against this capacitor. This is the other part of the tuning capacitor and you can see their dotted line showing that these two things are ganged together. You turn one, you turn the other. They're all on the, the same one tuning knob. So this is where you're generating the local oscillator frequency. I think I was explaining on an earlier video how these things were were uh, how you had another oscillator in the radio producing a frequency away from the target tuned frequency equal, putting it kind of sadly, equal to the tuning frequency of these transformers here. Look, it's 460 kilohertz, not 455, as is commonly used. So this develops an oscillation. You need a feedback to get an oscillator to produce sustained oscillations. So you can see the cathode current is passed through this coil. It's transformed a bit into this coil. So whatever the main current is flowing in the tube is fed through here, and transformed in here, snuck into this coil, back on a grid, and there's the oscillator circuit sitting here like that. So, so this thing conceivably, if we're listening to 590, this thing is going 460 kilohertz, 460 kilohertz above that. Add them together, what do you get? Uh, 1010? I'm not sure. You get a million, around, around a million, I guess. Just not even thinking too hard about it. Those two frequencies are in this tube affecting the tube current together. And that's why they mix a little more to it than that, but that's good enough for now. They mix, you get the four products, you get the, the, the two originals, you get the sum and the difference. The difference frequency is going to be, if you tune this 
in accordance to that, so 590 here and a million or so here, you'll get a 460 signal coming out of 460 kilohertz, and it's going to find its way through here. All the other guys, well, they don't go anywhere. In fact, to some degree, when they look at this circuit, they see a short circuit to some degree. So they're, they're killed, more or less, in, in, right in here. Okay, so let's carry on. The 460 kilohertz now it comes into this transformer. The transformer is tuned by these two capacitors. We saw screws on the top of the cans I showed earlier. The screws are controlling these two guys. And the objective is to make these uh, resonant at 460 kilohertz. The output from this side is fed to the grid of this tube where it's amplified. This is very important in terms of making the radio uh, sensitive. This is where most of the amplification takes place in the RF circuits. And the output from here goes into another very similar arrangement, a, trans a tuned transformer, IF transformer. Uh, some interesting filtering here. Lots of little filtering going on here and there, which I'm not going to go into because I don't fully understand exactly what they're doing here. Not to worry about it though, it doesn't matter. The output from here comes along and arrives on a diode plate. This tube, very common tube, 6, whoops, six SQ7, uh, has two diodes in it. Uh, one of them they're just throwing away. Don't pay, pay no attention to the diode on pin 4. Diode on pin 5 has the 460 kilohertz RF signal on it. And through rectifier action, because current can only flow one way in these tubes, from the hot element to the cold element, we get a rectified output. But still, with lots of RF, all, all RF more or less. That output is taken down this way, meets, oh, I have company in here. Okay, I'm probably gonna have to stop shortly because my cat won't, he's not gonna leave me alone, I imagine. Um, so this is a, a, this is a small capacitor. I was gonna say this would be a fair size capacitor, but it's not. So all these capacitors and resistors are sized in conjunction with each other to produce certain kinds of filtering actions. And in, you know, the objective here is to get rid of the RF. And then what you're left with is what's sometimes called the envelope or the audio portion of the signal. So that's what's happening here, even though this is a bit of a small capacitor. Look down the way, you see a big resistor here talk about that in a moment. The uh, audio now with the RF suppressed, or removed, or however you want to look at it, is now fired through the radio phono switch. Some capacitors and stuff in here to affect the tone. And the result comes out here. We have a capacitor to stop any DC that's here because there will be DC sitting here, low, low voltage DC voltage here because of the rectifier up here. It's rectified the AC coming out of here, and now you've got, uh, is that pul pulsing DC? Pulsing, pulsing DC, uh, or half-wave rectified AC, and then again, this capacitor and other things are getting rid of the pulsing part of it. And you're left just with a nice audio signal here. So this guy's blocking DC, and then it goes into the top of the volume control, bottom of the volume control going straight to what I assume is the chassis. We have this connection on the back of the volume control. I believe the purpose of this is so as you reduce the volume to fairly low levels, you actually peak up the treble and bass. Don't quote me on that. I'm not sure about that at all. In fact, don't quote me on anything here. You got, you got, your, own, uh, you got your own skull with your own brain in it. So I can only tell you what's what's coming out of mine. So this is just a simple voltage divider or potentiometer, and off of it comes the uh, signal that's the audio signal is going to be passed on through the rest of the radio. And we have another capacitor here. This one's fairly large. 
and then it's up onto the grid of this tube. Now we're back in the same tube here because the clever tube designers realize that all radios need some of these and need some of these. Well, why not stick them in the same tube? Even though they're in the same tube, it's really two different things going on here. So the second thing is an audio amplifier. You might want to call it a preamp. Taking a fairly low level signal, boosting it up so it's suitable to drive the output tube here. The signal comes along here, gets through this capacitor, very important capacitor here, uh, re replaced I'm sure in this radio already, but uh, this capacitor in an older radio can leak a little bit. This is one of the places where a little bit of leak can do a lot of harm because it'll change the bias voltage of the of the uh, grid here. So the grid is attached to the chassis through a large resistor. If there's enough leak here, it's going to push this voltage positive. You may not notice it when you're listening to the radio, but meanwhile, this tube is really humping. It's got more current going through it than it's really needed or intended. And that's why one of the reasons why these tubes can wear out fairly quick. The other reason the output tube wears out fairly quick is it is designed to work hard. It's hotter than the other tubes, and it, that's just why it wears out quicker. It's doing harder work, harder current, more current going through here. So this guy t tends to wear out and requires replacement periodically. These ones can last a long time, comparatively speaking. The output from here is then fed through these plugs through this coil, and then it will return down this way. Uh, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know what's going on there. But it'll return here and um, what's going on here? Oh, I see what's going on. The, this plug represents a plug that plugs into the power supply. So it's picking up the B plus. I didn't talk about this part yet. But on this line will be um, a couple hundred volts, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. And that, that table should tell us what kind of voltage is here. This is filtering to, designed to um, get rid of the hum that's inevitably coming coming from this arrangement here. Um, the higher filtering filtered. No, I'll take that back. Well, maybe I can say that. There's a greater degree of filtering here than there is here. The little bit of hum that's left here is inconsequential. It's too low to be heard under ideal conditions. So no need to super filter the B plus going to this tube. But there is a need to super filter, if I can use that term, the B plus going to these tubes because any little hum back here is going to be amplified and boosted and it's really going to show up out here. So you need, you need this to be very, very hum-free through here. Both 30 microfarad capacitors in that metal can. We didn't hear any hum at all from this radio when we operated it. At least I didn't notice any. But the speaker is out of the cabinet. And these low, low frequencies are greatly suppressed when the speaker is just sitting out in the open air like, like it is here. So I wouldn't be surprised to put this whole thing back together in the cabinet and begin hearing a hum I couldn't hear before. I've been fooled a number of times by that. Bet you I'm not alone. So we have a DC going through this coil to operate the tube, the B plus, and then we have AC, the output signal, or the variation in that DC, in here, and through transformer action, this coil is energized here. So this is the transformer that's mounted on the back of the speaker, the one that uh, Grandpa hooked some wires up to. The output from here is fed to the voice coil, which they pictured here. And they show a PM permanent magnet here. And this is LS loudspeaker one, number one. Well, there is only one. Maybe in some other models, there's another one. So loudspeaker one. Of course, the varying magnetic field here makes this coil want to go back and forth. It's installed, remember the spider I showed uh, inside the speaker? So this part can move, and it moves the cone, and presto, that makes your, your ear uh, 
parts in your ear move. But then through a process of literally, literal magic, we somehow construct the experience that we have as human beings from this vibration, what we call sound. It's really, really a miracle that we all take for granted because it's been operating 100% for most of us anyway, all our lives. And uh, we, we take the whole thing for granted, but a real miracle goes on. So if we could carry this diagram on, we would have something enormously more interesting and magical out here, our head, than all this stuff back here, which is really quite mundane in comparison. So it's so easy to forget that the exciting part is we can hear this. Not not that it produces sound, but that we can hear it. That's that's the exciting part. Okay, let's go take a peek at the power supply very quickly. So we have the primary here, 120 volts on this, and we have quite a number of secondaries. Why so many? I'm not sure. Let's see. So we have a couple light bulbs hooked up on the yellow. I'm not going to pick this all apart because there's really no need to. Uh, where's this one going? Number six. Red. Oh. What? Red. Six. So I, I got it wrong here. I counted it wrong. Six is up here. Yeah, this makes better sense. So this is the high voltage winding. You can see pictorially they've showed many more turns here. So it makes sense you know, when you look at it. Center tapped to ground. Full wave rectification. The pulsy output goes here. Six. Six goes up to the filter and so on. Now, this, this one I follow back, I guess it's eight, not six, it's eight. Eight is here, yellow, yellow goes to the lights. Well, what's going on with X? So usually they're showing, yeah, here we are. So you see the, we haven't talked about this too, but we'll, we'll in a minute. So this heater is showing with Y, 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 Y between two and seven, between two and seven, so it's on here. This one, it looks like the light bulbs are powered separately from the tubes. Why, why they would do that, I don't know offhand. Uh, typically the lights are uh, energized by the same thing as the tubes, especially in a radio like this, all these are all six volt tubes. So we have a YY here, if we look at the other tubes, a little different. Okay, maybe the answer is going to come more clearly here. We have X. X to ground, X to ground, X to ground, it means they're using the chassis to convey some of the power that runs the heaters. Save on some wire, I guess. So let's look again, why and why, 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 why? So the reason why is because of this tube in particular. We'll talk now about this, this tube. So the unusual thing about this receiver to me is that it's designed to work with magnetic cartridge, which makes it a, a, a step above a lot of consoles and record players from back in this era. The thing about a magnetic cartridge is they're very weak, very weak, the signal's very weak, it needs a lot of help. That's what this tube is doing. So this is a special amplifier. You won't find this in most of these radios. And its purpose is to simply boost up the weak signal coming from the cartridge. So the problem with this kind of thing is if there's any hum or anything on this input line here, it's going to really come out the speaker. And one source of hum is the fact that the heaters are powered with AC power. Now, it does have a separate cathode. The cathode is a piece of metal heated by the heater and then the cathode is busy uh, emitting electrons and, and is an integral part of the operation of the tube. The heater is literally just heating this, this part up. But nevertheless, if we were to look at the heater with uh, super high speed film, uh, we would see that it's pulsing, that the, uh, the AC current is coming and going, and the heat is pulsing. Now there's a lot of heat uh, uh, heat heat capacity and 
stuff like that. So in a, in a way, similar to how a filter filters out the AC hum, the heater itself, temperature change is minimized by its own thermal capacity, would that be? Not really thermal momentum. Don't know what the right word is for it, but things don't cool off instantly, do they? So you turn the power off, this thing doesn't immediately drop the room temperature. It takes time. But nevertheless, because this is such a sensitive amplifier, any little action here is going to cause a result in the tube. Unless, unless, unless you can make this completely independent of the rest of the radio. If you can isolate it away, it may not have any effect in terms of generating a hum. And I believe that's what they've done down here. In order to enable this very sensitive circuit, they've added another section on the transformer here designed to power specifically the heater here and not be grounded. Well, actually, you see, it is grounded, but it's grounded in the center. See, this winding for the other tubes is grounded at one end. And that's why they can do, do this grounding up here. The current has the right place to go back here. But this one, they grounded it in the center. This results in a, a balance. I mean, I'm not going to be able to describe this really well. Uh, but a, a balance which in effect reduces this problem of the heater causing a hum. Let's just leave it at that. These are special steps that are taken in this radio to enable it to work with this magnetic cartridge. So this is money in design here. You can see some extra filtering stuffed in here. Uh, probably again to try to deal with the sensitivity of this. And it looks like all kinds of um, things that would affect the uh, tonal tonal balance of the cartridge and the whole the whole setup. Um, so back back back. I don't know when. At some point, some engineer realized that if you recorded the sound on a record with the treble turned up high. So if you listen to the record without any influence, you would hear a very shrill result. It would not be very attractive, and the bass would be weak. If you did it like that, then you brought that shrill, high treble signal into something like this, but then took action to reduce the treble back to the normal range, you would also reduce a lot of hiss and noise. It would get reduced along with it. That's, bas that's basically Dolby, I think, really. I, I guess Dolby is this idea taken further yet. So they standard this idea was so good they standardized on it. It's the I don't know I I A S R R some kind of response curve. I can't I can't think of exactly what it is right now. That could very well be implemented here. Some of these capacitors could be and, and resistors could be uh, doing that. Um, I believe the word is emphasis. Maybe is the right word for it. So this would be a de-emphasis circuit. I don't know, I'm just guessing, but there's an awful lot of resistors in here and capacitors and stuff going on. I guess, you know, if you're going to do this magnetic cartridge thing, you want to take great care that the benefits of the magnetic cartridge come through in the speaker. So no fooling around here. you got to get down to some serious audio engineering. That's what this would represent, all this stuff here. And where's the output go? So. Let's follow it through. So we come into this first grid. The signal is then amplified in the tube onto this plate, so to speak. If you look, you'll see the plate output through a capacitor to the grid of the other side. There's really two amplifiers in series. So the boosted signal reaches here and is further amplified. And then off it goes. Off it goes. Off it goes where? Um, is, is that off? Is that going off or is that? I don't know. Here, here's where it goes. It comes up here. Ooh, that's heavy duty filtering. They can't be, this can't be the sound coming through here. Well, I'm not spotting it right now. 
it's going out here yeah it's going out here so this is probably the DC coming in to operate the tube the actual audio signal is coming out here coming up here I'm going to the phono switch so you can access it by flipping over to phono through here and then off to the volume control of course when you flick it over to phono you flick it off the radio so you think the audio signal levels here and here are pretty similar because from then on it's the same old thing going through the amplifier going through the power amplifier and out so uh, so this is a very very nice uh, a receiver and amplifier uh, what else have we got here? switch on as in radio base position any other little hints here that I missed sometimes some pretty important information can be written here all capacities are in picofarad unless otherwise specified notice that's in different type there all wattage ratings of resistors are half watt resistor tolerances are plus or minus 20 tube and trimmer location to help do the alignment it's on this page uploaded by Tom Seeger and downloaded by me that's today okay let's look at the next page I'm going to study this one in great detail there's too much on it right now and I'm sure you've had enough of this let's go through it the main, main thing you know, I'll focus on what I need to focus on right now which is the this chart this is what we're going to make use of next so let's let's focus on that I also read the general description. The Model C702 radio receiver is a six-tube AC-operated superheterodyne receiver with a Model CP10VM950 automatic record changer built into a modernistic, modernistic design cabinet with a finish of light oak, mahogany, or walnut as desired. I'm not sure which one this is. I've got here. The phono mechanism is, of course, this isn't the record player that's in this particular one. This, this record player has been replaced by the one we were looking at a couple of videos ago. The phono mechanism is mounted on a smooth running pullout drawer on the left side of the cabinet. It's true, it's very smooth running. While the receiver chassis is mounted on the right, a spring loaded tilting panel. Spring loaded? Didn't, didn't feel spring loaded. A type 6SC7 Radiotron as a phono preamplifier, that's a tube we were just talking about, is built into the main chassis. The power transformer and 5Y4 rectifier are incorporated in a separate power unit mounted in the bottom of the cabinet. Conditions of test. So how did they get these voltages is what they're going to explain. All voltages measured with a 20,000 ohm per volt voltmeter. That's a very good voltmeter. So. I can easily use my uh, vacuum tube voltmeters and probably get exactly these numbers. Uh, you know, back in the day, a lot of repair guys had really terrible meters. And if you went to measure these voltages, the meters might pull some of them down. So instead of 225, you might get 190 or something like that. So th this is the hint. All voltages measured between socket terminals and the chassis. Line voltage at 117 volts, volume control in the minimum position, no signal input. Okay, that's not too tough. Well, what did it say here? Stage gain and voltage checks. Stage gain measurements being made of the vacuum tube. Voltmeter to check circuit performance and to locate stage not operating properly. The reading should have a tolerance of 20%. This gives you gains. These things are tricky to measure. Um, audio gains. To me, in the end, play the radio and see if it's loud enough. And this might be useful if you're really trying to hunt down a, a problem you're having trouble finding. This this information might be useful. Oscillator grid bias. The DC voltage developed across the oscillator grid leak resistor averages nine volts at a thousand kilohertz. So th this is raising the question of: uh, Is the oscillator strong enough? Is it oscillating? sufficiently to do the job. The weak oscillator results in a weak output at the speaker. So here they're telling you, you will read nine volts if you use, I guess, this kind of meter on it. Uh, 
less sensitive meters that draw more current could actually kill the oscillator as soon as you hook it up and just stop oscillating or something like that can happen. So socket pin voltages, figure four, that's this one, isn't it? Yeah, figure four. Socket pin voltages. Figure four shows typical two pin voltages. All readings should be made from the pins to the ground to ground, which is the chassis, unless otherwise specified. Well, are any of these otherwise specified? So I'm looking for a little marker. Don't see it. Yeah, I, 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 they look like they all go to maybe here. So the output of the uh, transformer itself on the secondary side, 280 volts. 80, 80, okay, don't don't know why these are different, but I'm not going to worry about it. I have to spend too much time looking at wires and stuff. Not important. So what's important is going through each of these tubes with a voltmeter and verifying that these voltages are present. What this can lead me to is a bad resistor, a depressed voltage. If you remember, at the end of the video yesterday, I was commenting about how the sound was a little bit garbled and I was scratching my head about that. Then I realized I had the voltage the receiver running on a, a depressed voltage because the dim bulbs were still in. When I took the dim bulbs out and ran it closer to the correct voltage, 100 and, it's running around 110, still not up at 117, the garble went away. And that suggested to me that something might be a little close to the line. One of these voltages might already be a little off and with the reduced supply voltage, the little off becomes too much off. The full voltage gets it into the operating range, but maybe not all the way to where it should be. So I wouldn't be surprised if we find one, one of these or two of these not correct. If you notice the, uh, the, I believe this is the detector here. The voltages are low, 50 and 70, and not high, and if you look at the Output tube, we should find very high voltages there, 236 and 250. This is probably the plate, this is probably the screen voltage, and very high. Whereas the rest of the tubes, you know, 240, 225. Well, it's not much lower, is it? 240 is not much below 250. But this is the guy who's doing the work on the speaker, so he needs all the power he can muster. So we expect a higher or a high plate voltage on the output tube. Okay, from here it's get the voltmeter going and check it all out. Okay, so in the top left corner you obviously see my my voltmeter here. We'll be using to make these measurements. I printed out the information here and this diagram, if I turn it over, fits the radio. So we have one, two, three tubes, one, two, three tubes. And even if you look at the diagram, you can see the key in the middle of the tubes, which way the key is pointing. Like like this one is pointing, pointing this way, this key is pointing that way, this one's pointing that way, and if you look on the radio, they all match up. So this is a nice easy diagram to help get the right pin for the for the test. That's great. Now before we get going, let's take a closer look in here. Let me get this just a little bit closer. What has Grandpa done in here? Now we know he did the capacitors, but wait. Did he do them all? I certainly thought so. Then I started looking more carefully, and I realized that, hey, there's, there's orange ones, and then there's these brown ones. Now my assumption was he did all these brown ones too. Yeah, I think that's actually the case. The way I've proved it out is by looking at, at them for evidence of a repair technique. The typical repair technique is rather than connect the new lead from the capacitor straight to a terminal, you connect it to a wire tail that you've left in there when you cut the old part out. So that's very common. I call Sometimes I call it the hooky, hooky technique, and kind of hooking the two wires together and then soldering up the, the hook. So there is one brown capacitor down here, I know it's a little hard to see in the camera, and it is done that way. It is connected here to a piece of wire that comes back over here. So, you know, the, 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 these are uh, 
too too new. Uh, a style of capacitor could be found in a radio like this originally. I'm pretty sure I mean, you couldn't find this these brown guys. I wish the image was just a little easier to look at, but it's not. So okay, so we changed all the capacitors except for the one that I changed here. What about the resistors? Well, if you look in here for a while, your eye's going to find this. Well, these are obviously different than all the rest of the resistors. Now, all the rest of the resistors are brown-bodied resistors, but these ones have a, a white or creamy color body on them, and there's two of them here. Maybe you can't see it in the camera. There's two in parallel. So Grandpa, to get the right value resistor here, took what he had, two resistors, put them in parallel to get the right amount of resistance, and then installed it. So, so what that tells me is that uh, Grandpa took some time to uh, somehow detect these bad resistors. Now it could be everything from the radio didn't work and he figured out what it was. The resistor was burned right open, you could see it and replaced it. Or he did what I'm about to do, which is take voltage tests. Now, I'm really lucky in that I got all this information. I mean, we live in a wonderful world now where you just type into your computer and out of your printer comes one of those sheets. Boy, try that 25 or 30 years ago um, to get this kind of information not easy at all not easy at all nearly impossible in fact but today it's as easy as can be so what did he have at his disposal he obviously knew what he was doing he knew his way around this there's no question of that um he, he you know to do the stuff he must have had some test equipment of some amount i don't really know what he did as a uh, living maybe he was doing this as a living i don't know he was electrical, that's that's all I know. He, he had electrical knowledge. Well, what about, so, so there's a couple other resistors in here which look a little bit newish. There's one here. There's a ball, a ball of uh, solder right here, right, on, right next to the body, which suggests this was installed as a replacement. Not very likely, it's just, it's just across the input uh, for the phono input. If we took a look at the schematic, we could we could see if this is something he added or not. Solder looks a little fresh. I'm not sure. Another one over here also looks the same. Looks like a newer resistor, but maybe not. I don't know. But certainly these tell me that uh, Grandpa was uh, was he was not a slouch at doing this stuff. No doubt about it. Um, now there was a couple of large wattage resistors in here. One you can see here. This another one's hard to see. It's 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 down here. It's this brown one down here. Uh, they don't look changed. They look original. The, these guys, uh, you know, they're large wattage because they're going to get warm. Even though they're large, they still will get warm. Warm stuff wears out quickly. That, that's why it's great to live in Canada. <laughs> in Canada, you're going to last a long time. Um, so these ones, they, they, they could be in trouble. Resistors normally go high. They don't always do that, but mostly they tend to go up in resistance. And uh, a couple other things can happen to them. The, there can be lead separation inside, uh, where the wire coming in is separated from the resistive element that's inside. And the whole thing just goes open. And in the worst case, they burn right out. They find them and burn right apart none of that in here. So we, we want to know about, about these two resistors. Along the way, doing the voltage test may reveal if these are uh, good or bad. I don't know offhand if the voltage tests are going to reveal that. Okay, so what I should do is I should turn this guy on, uh, let him warm up. Everything's connected, the speaker's on, the antenna's on, everything's, everything's on. So the voltages are normal. It said no no input, so we could flip the phono and there'd be no input. I don't want to do that. Keep the volume down and start uh, poking around. Now, I'm not going to start with the power supply. It's sitting over here. I'm just going to leave it out of the picture for now. The power supply voltages appear in here, so measuring in here may lead us back to a problem with the power supply. But it's very unlikely because there's nothing over there but a bunch of wires, a transformer, and one tube. So the, the, the tube over here, which I haven't tested any of the tubes yet, if it were poor, if it were poor, it has a higher and higher voltage drop within itself. Less and less voltage making it to the radio. Maybe we'll pick that up when we're doing these measurements. 
So once again, thank you, Grandpa, for excellent work done some time ago. Don't know when. I'm going to go through this and uh, check it out. Let's see here. Link's plugged in. And I think we're safe to start it up. So let me just have volumes over here. Switches off. Apply power through the dim bulbs. Let's keep our eye on those bulbs just when I first turn it on. There we go. Okay. Bulbs are doing the normal thing. That's good. Let it warm up. No concern about a short circuit somehow being in here. In fact, we'll put it on full voltage. You can see the uh, you can see the actual voltage we're supplying here. We'll make sure this is 117. Is that what it said? I'm sure it said 117. Line voltage at 117 volts. So we will put it there. Okay, so I just have a little knob over here I have to turn to get it there. I'll go up a little bit. This is what I don't like about digital meters is there's a delay in the reading. Okay, I'm just gonna... well, that's interesting. We hear something now. I think that's just the radio warming up. I don't think it had anything to do with the voltage here. Come on. Doesn't have to be that exact. In fact, the voltage is going to wander up and down as things go on and off in my house and my neighbor's houses and stuff like that. Okay. Let me give it a little bit of time to... The antenna now is just just laying on my bench here rather recklessly, so should 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 we have trouble picking stuff up? Let's flip it to phono. Big click there. That's full volume on phono. No phono input. Okay, we'll turn the volume down. We'll leave it in the phono position. We could see from the schematic that all that phono switch was doing was switching the audio part radio. I'm going to just raise this up a little bit. There, get the whole thing in view. I'm just going to leave it running like this for a little while while I go and drink some more coffee and we'll run through the voltages. Okay, here we go. Let's see, we're pretty much exactly 117 volts at the moment. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, might as well start with this tube this tube and we'll just come around one two three three is the first one to check 250 volts now the meter over here is on a 500 volt scale so 250 is going to be straight up right where it says 25 this is the big first test and I think we're going right here and this out 300 wow now my meter is quite well calibrated I have no reason to really doubt that 310 instead of 250. It's working better than expected. I don't know, is that a problem? So I'm going to write the number here. 310. I'm not sure how to interpret that. Next pin over should be a little less. 236. Wow, they have it down to a single volt here. 236. That's a little surprising. That would be right here. Okay, and I read that as basically 250. I think the ratio is similar. 250. 250. Okay, there's another reading down here. 13 volts on pin number 8. 13 volts on pin number 8. So we'll change the scale here to We'll start with 50 volts full scale, so 13 is down around here. And we'll touch this. Okay, and what do we get? Let's put it up on a 15 volt scale. We're reading nine, about nine and a half volts instead of 13. That's a little low. Don't know exactly what I'm reading, but I imagine this kind of voltage is 
indicating a bias on the on the tube. Even though it's positive, it's just the kind of the way things are how they've biased this tube. So that's a little that's a little low. Is it important? I don't know. Uh, 9.5. So I'll write 9.5 here. 9.5. I'm not going to bother with the heater voltages. We're on to the next tube. Should find very similar sorts of things. The next tube over is here. What we want to do is I want to look for 62 volts on pin number six. So, okay, so this is now 150 volt scale. 62 is right around where my finger is. <clears throat> 62. I want to come back. 876. So I go 876. That's this one here. Ooh, scare me. And what do we read there? So on the 150 volt scale, it's 50 volts. 50 volts instead of, I think that says 62. It says 82. I think that says 82. Let me just write it here. 50 volts. No, no other test on this tube. Just that one. So we got some high and some low. If they were all, you know, 10% high, then I would think they're all correct in a sense. Some high, some low. Hmm. For the next tube, we're looking at 50 volts on this tube, pin number five, right beside the pin that's grounded. That's got to be right in here. Wait a minute now. Tricky for me to. I got to look in two places at once here. I'm a little nervous about my voltmeter wandering off. What's that say? That was up, that was up that was up around here, wasn't it? So that would be around 40 volts. Let's put this on the 50 volt scale. So and we're expecting it to go to 50. So it should go full scale right up to here. Try it again. I hate looking away when I've got something in the radio like that. So I have 45 is what's what it's reading at. That's pretty darn close. 45. Another one over on the other side, 70. This must be the detector that we're doing. I'm guessing. Um, and that's pin number two, 70 volts. So we'll put this up to 150. 70 is almost straight up. Pin number two. Pin number two. It's not very hard to see the key in there. There's too many parts in the way. The actual pins are numbered, maybe, and that's also hard to see. Pin number two, I th is a not is it not grounded? So I can see the grounded ones next to it. It's this one. It's this one with the re change resistors. We're almost dead on. That'd be about 70 volts there. So we got one that's actually correct. 70. Okay, exactly 117 volts supplied to it now. Okay, next tube we'll do is this one. We see a number of voltages here. Two volts on pin number five. Two volts. Well, we'll put this down to 15 to start with. Two volts on pin five. Now, if I touch the wrong pin, it's going to throw my meter over, but it won't damage this kind of meter. And I don't think you can really damage it by a wrong scale and you know, getting the. Except. If you whack it hard enough, you can bend the uh, you can bend the pointer. I guess, I guess you could always, you know, there must be some self-limiting in the meter, so you're not likely to uh, to burn the coil out down here. That would be bad. So get on pin number five. There's no really good hint on it where it is. <clears throat> pin number five, so I can actually see the numbers here see them but I can't read them looks like five six seven that's not the right order we count them ourselves one two three four this is five okay very low voltage five volts full scale we're looking for two volts so we're looking at something up around here okay back on right around there Two volts. OK, 
Okay, the next one over is a hundred volts, 102. Once again, wow, they're getting very precise numbers here, which is kind of surprising. So it's just the next pin over. It's this guy. Oh, what was that? Oh, I'm on the 50 volt scale. That's what happened there. Okay, on the 150 volt scale, 100 volts is right here. 100 volts. One of the reasons that I, I do this all the time, I look in the meter and I say to myself, this is where it should be, so I don't have to think about it when I'm doing the test. I, I've, already, I've already thought about where it's supposed to come up. Uh, helpful to you, too, when you're watching this being done. Um, again, number six, this is it. That looks like 90 volts to me. 90 volts, not 102. 90. That's it for that tube. Now we're down to the last one, 6SA7. This guy um, coming around and just following the order of the numbers. The first one is pin 3 at 240 volts, so I'll move that up to the 500 volt scale. 240 pretty much straight up. 240 on pin number 3, 1, 2, 3, right there. 250. 250 is what we get. The next pin over should be 100. So I'll flip this to the 150 scale. 100 is right here. Next pin over has got the capacitor on it I put on. And it looks like 90 volts to me. Both of them, both of them are, no, 90. And that's it. That's it. Um, so what's this telling us? Well, am I right? The output tube is, uh, this guy here is the output tube. It's got very high voltages on the plate. It's going to give you a good volume. Is it a concern? I don't think so. Are any of these a concern? I don't think so. I think they're all reasonably well, well enough. You know, 250 instead of 240, uh, really, it's just, not, it's just not enough to worry about. 310 instead of 250, well, so this is supposed to be 250 and then less, 236. So this is 310 and then less, 250. Could repeat those just to see if I have buggered them up. But I don't think, again, there's anything much to be concerned about here. We, we could always check the maximum plate voltage for this tube to 6V6. Why don't we do that? 6V6. Let's just make sure we're not over the 6V6. Six V six beam power tube. Maximum ratings. Plate voltage. Three fifteen max. Wow, we're right there. Grid number two, the screen voltage. Two eighty five. And I'm measuring two fifty. I'm measuring three ten when three fifteen is the max. So what exactly happens if you go too high? So here we have typical operation. They give some different operating ranges. Here's one where the plate voltage is the max, 315. Which is a good number two should be 225. So interestingly enough, if you use a lower plate voltage, 250, you use the same screen voltage, 250. Same thing if you go even lower. But when you get up here at 315, you're using a lower well, that's interesting. It's actually lower, 225, than here, 250. Now, there is a uh, voltage given here for the grid bias, and we do want to take a look at that. Now, it didn't appear in the chart. Oh, 13. Yes, it does. It does appear, and I measured it, 9.5. So the bias is a little low. That's a pretty important thing. We should think about this a little bit. Bias is a little low. Which pin was that? That was pin number eight. So if we go over and we just do double check pin number eight for nine volts.
just to see what it is now. So 15 volt scale, nine is right up here. What we really want though is 13 almost all the way. Let me touch this here. 9.5 still. So the less negative, uh, yeah, the less the less that voltage, the less bias on the tube, the more tube current is flowing. So we have lowered bias, higher B plus. That's just a little uncomfortable for operating that tube. Let's take a look again at 6B6. Consider that. So 6V6, so this could indicate some resistor somewhere, it's just a little too far out. TUV, V, V, TUV, TU, 6V6. So at 315 volts on the plate, the expectation is minus 13 for the uh, control grid bias, or, or 13, it depends, it depends on how they've arranged the bias in here. They're using, I'm sure they're using a cathode resistor. Well, I'm not sure. We'd have to look at the uh, schematic to be absolutely sure of that. So it's possible the cathode resistor has gone, well, if it would go high, this number would be bigger, I think. Is this enough to worry about? Nine versus, you know, it's about 70% of what it should be. They come down these lower voltages, it's still pretty high here, 12.5. 180 you're, you're getting you need less so what can be happening is this tube can be conducting more current than it's intended to conduct when it's just sitting there like it is now not something you can necessarily hear or become aware of during the operation and result is the heavy current uh, wears out the cathode early another interesting question is well could the tube itself be causing this because the tube has already worn out to some degree seemed to me there was lots of volume coming out of this. But a logical next step would be to go ahead and test all these tubes just to see what's up with them. Um, yeah, why don't we do that? Now, let, before we do that, let's just take a look at the uh, bias resistor. So the bias resistor would be on the cathode. I closed my book a little too soon. Let's open it up again, 6v6. Look at the diagram, cathode's on 8. So look on pin 8 for the resistor coming off of it. Let me get a pointer here. Pin 8 is this one, this is yellow wire coming way around. It's meeting up with the uh, capacitor. So it's meeting up with the big capacitor because the, there's a section in this multi-section capacitor designed specifically to bypass the grid resistor. Now, where's the resistor? Okay, so the resistor, it's very hard to see in the camera. The resistor is buried under here. And it's another, not high wattage, but a larger wattage resistor right here. And the other side of it is connected to a grounded terminal here. So it all makes sense. It says, it looks like it's a 33, well, I'm gonna guess that's a brown. So it's orange, orange, brown. So that's 330. 30. Let's see what the tube manual says about that. Tube manual is full of information. 6V6. Just look down the list here for ohms. There we are. Ohms. No, nope, that's not it. Ohms. No, nope, not, not, not it either. Well, you're not going to give it here. Plate resistance. Some, I'm looking for cathode resistor. Push pull. looking at that. I don't think it's going to give it on this. Again, very carefully. Maximum power output minus 5 watts. Plane resistance, maximum signal grid, zero. Zero signal grid, two current, maximum signal plate current, zero signal half. Doesn't give it. Maybe up here? No. So unfortunately it's not telling us what kind of resistor you would use to operate this tube using cathode biasing. A lot of times it does. Drat. 
330 is certainly typical of these kinds of resistors. I'm just looking for a 330 number here or something like that. No, nothing. No hint. Okay. Um, so we, we can test that resistor. Now, am I, am I done with this operating? I think I am. So I'm going to cut the power off. And uh, we're going to give that just a moment to relax. And we're going to try to measure the resistance of that resistor right in the circuit. Now, one of the interesting things about this whole radio is it's running with its original filter capacitor. And often in these radios of this vintage, the original power supply filter capacitor is bad, bad, bad. Not in here. Is there a chance that Grandpa changed it? I'm just feeling the heat from this. My hand is cold, actually. This is nice. Did, did Grandpa change change it with a, one that looks exactly like the original? Kind of doubt it. It's pretty busy work in here. This is this is tough to do. A lot of terminals, wires. Today the wires are stiff. Can't be muck, mucking around with them too much. I don't think he did anything. I think we're in pretty good shape with that, actually. So I'm not inclined to do anything either. If the bypass capacitor around the cathode resistor is weak and not doing its job, then some of the signal that you want in the uh, primary of the output transformer is being wasted in the resistor. It causes a little bit of reduction in volume and probably a few other odd oddball things. Okay, it's got to be ready for a test. Let's measure it. this guy to do it. My leads here. Okay, so this meter is set set to where where can you see it here? resistor here, trying to get my hand in front of the meter. Uh, you might have to believe what I'm going to say. The other side is just going to ground. 382. 382 ohms instead of 330 ohms. In, in my mind, the higher, let's see, the, 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 the higher the resistor, the greater the bias. So how do we end up with a low bias of 9? When we have, uh, is it, is it, I don't know, is the higher plate voltage than uh, prescribed here? Or should be higher current flowing through the tube? I don't know how to reason that out. Uh, the question would be, is it worth doing something about? It? Maybe not. Why don't we go through the tube testing process and then, then we got kind of a whole picture of what's going on, but for now the radio seems to be in good operating order. There's nothing seriously wrong. All the voltages are there and close to what they're normally supposed to be. Let's get the tubes done. 